Listen now to a reading from Matthew's Gospel. Hear a word from the 14th chapter, beginning at the 22nd verse. Then Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was many furlongs distant from land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost, and they cried out for fear. But immediately he spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I, have no fear. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, bid me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink and cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, O oh, man of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God shall stand forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Grant, O oh Lord, that we might be the masters of ourselves to become the servants of others. Take our minds and think through them. Take our lips and speak through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire for thee. Amen. Well, it is good to be back today from our bike foray out in Nebraska. Um, 300 or so miles riding out there in the wide open plains. Uh, it's our third time to go out there as a group. There were six of us this time. And every time I go, it confirms for me a couple of things. One thing it confirms is that Methodists tend to be adventurous and generous people. Those little churches in those towns out in southern, southern Nebraska, they would roll out the red carpet, you know, and feed us and welcome us, encourage us on. And I'm just reminded it's good to be part of a, of a church that tends to be caring and, and wants to do things that are positive for the larger world. So that was one thing. And the other thing that remi I'm reminded of every time we go and do this is that cycling is one of those activities that is best done in groups. You know, there, some athletic endeavors are, are by nature solo things. You know, you, uh, somebody who swims uh, wants the lap wide open. You know, the fewer people in the pool, the better. If you're a lap swimmer, it's good to do, do that by yourself. Or running, I'm a runner, and, I, and in a sense, running tends to be more of a solitary endeavor. You know, the, the cliche, the loneliness of the long distance runner is a cliche, partly because it's true, most times it, it's good to just sort of run by yourself and ruminate and, and kind of have a little private time. But cycling, not that way. Cycling is best with other people for a lot of reasons. For one thing, it's just safer. Uh, people see you better in a group than they do uh, if you're by yourself. So there's that kind of reassurance that you're less likely to get clobbered by a semi or something like that. That's reassuring. Uh, and, and the other thing is uh, that literally it is easier to do in a group than it is by yourself. Uh, if you're a race car fan, you, you already know about this concept. It's called drafting, right? Where, where the, the lead car, or in this case, the lead rider, literally kind of punches a hole in the air and creates a, a slipstream. It's not a vacuum, but it's a lessened headwind. And so the way that you ride is in a, in a line. The, the lead rider, who change, we change that frequently, but there's one lead rider who's responsible for facing the headwind and creating the slipstream, and then you just ride, you know, front wheel to back wheel. In, in a line, and uh, sports, you, you, it's noticeably easier if you're behind. You, you, you kind of get towed along a little bit. Uh, physiologists, sports physiologists who've researched this say it's about 20% less effort to be behind a lead rider than to be the one out there uh, pushing, the, pushing the hole in the wind. Uh, and, and I, 
having benefited from that all week, you know, hour after hour, uh, taking a turn at the front, but then most of the time being in the line, uh, you, you, get a, you get time to think out there, uh, pedaling along, and it occurred to me, faith is like that in some ways, don't you think? I mean, the word disciple literally means follower, uh, which is to say a person who lines up in the slipstream, so to speak, uh, of Jesus. Uh, a disciple is somebody who looks to Jesus' life and teachings and learns from them, in order to become like them. It, Jesus creating this kind of spiritual slipstream to get us through life, and, and so we can avoid, at least to a large degree, feeling like we're all alone in the headwind, you know, flailing around, trying to make our way uh, through our own cunning and our own strength. Uh, the, the slipstream of faith is what I was thinking about as I rode along in Nebraska, and it occurred to me that this gospel reading is but one example of many in terms of how that plays out in the disciples' lives, how they find themselves in that spiritual slipstream and how it made a difference for them. Uh, a famous story. Uh, the story begins with those disciples. Literally, they are facing the, the headwinds, aren't they? I mean, they're in a boat out far from shore on the Sea of Galilee, and it was a perilous thing, Matthew tells us. You know, in, in our modern times, we tend to think of, uh, of recreation when we think of boating and and lakes, but uh, back then, nobody boated for sport. That was it, boating was a dangerous and serious business that you would not do unless you had to. Boats in the first century were crudely made. Even the best of them would leak and need to be bailed out on a regular basis, and they were prone to sinking, especially in bad weather. And of course, you know, safety gear was non-existent. You know, your boat went down, you did too. And, and, and so it was not a recreational trip. The disciples are making this serious trip across the Sea of Galilee at night, and a storm comes up. And they, they row against the wind, waves crash over the bow, and, and some of them quite likely would have to stop rowing, uh, at least some of the time, to bail losing even more ground against the wind. And, and, and so you get a picture. It's a pretty desperate situation for them. Uh, this headwind, uh, all facing this all by themselves, wondering what's going to happen next. And, and thinking about that scene, I was reminded of a, a book I read some time back. Uh, the book's entitled, First You Have to Row a Little Boat. And it's by, written by a sailor, Richard Bodie. Uh, he, he's a lifelong uh, sailor and boater and, and loved that. And he says, what sailing taught him is about the relationship between himself and the elements over which he has no control. He says, uh, boaters sooner or later learn, you have to learn to live with whatever the weather gives you. You just can't control it. And he goes on to observe that most people live with the illusion that we are in control as we go through life, what Bodhi calls the presumption of dominion. But sooner or later, sooner or later, you know, we sail out on the, the big water and the wind comes up in a way we hadn't expected and we are, the fallacy of our being in control is exposed and it makes itself known. He writes this, one big sudden squall or gale force wind comes up out of nowhere and all of a sudden you know all too well of the puniness of your own efforts when measured against the momentous force of nature and you know we are not in total charge of our fate. We are subject to wind, to death, to accident, disease. We can, without warning, lose all. Love, work, home, and life. It's a good statement, I think. And the disciples find themselves in, in that kind of an out-of-control moment on the Sea of Galilee. Did you know Rembrandt, the, the famous artist, painted this scene once? And, and uh, can I put it up for, for me? This is Rembrandt's... Ad a rendition, uh, a, a kind of a famous painting. And what's interesting, it's hard to see in this, in this uh, uh, projection up here, but if you count the number of people on the boat, the disciples on the Sea of Galilee, you would think there would be 12, right? 12 disciples. But when Rembrandt painted this, he painted 13 people in the boat. And interestingly, art historians who have kind of looked at this very carefully, they see the face in the face of the 13th person. It's Rembrandt himself. This is a great way of saying it. Isn't that great? Uh, Rembrandt's way of saying, 
sooner or later, man, that's how it all, it, we all feel that way. Sooner or later, it's like the wave is going to overwhelm me, and I don't know what more I'm going to do. Uh, it, Matthew says uh, that's what the disciples were feeling, about overwhelmed, and then it happens. Matthew says it comes in the fourth watch of the night. You know the fourth watch of the night is between 3 o'clock and 6 o'clock, you know, when it's the darkest. I don't know about you, but everything seems worse at 3 o'clock in the morning than it actually is. You have those nights? I, I have a lot of them. I'm not a very good sleeper. And I, I fuss around and flop around in my bed, you know, at 3 o'clock in the morning. And all those things that I wish I could, I could address but can't address, it always seems worse. Why is that? It's always worse at 3 o'clock. You get up in the morning, it's like, well, that's not such a big deal. But at 3 o'clock, Matthew says, that's the time. That's the time Jesus comes. And he comes in the form of this shadowy figure walking on the waves. Take heart, do not fear, it is I. Walter Brueggemann, the, the Bible scholar, notes that the, uh, the words that are translated in English, take heart, could also be translated take self, uh, as in kind of get yourself together, uh, get yourself back, you know, be who you're called to be. And the surprising thing is, you know, at least this much we know, Peter does it, man. He, he rallies right away. He gets himself together and responds to that voice and does what no prudent person would do. He yells out and says, if that's you, let me come your way. Uh, if that's you, let me get out here and walk on the water too. And without hesitation, Jesus says, well, come ahead then. And that's the story. Peter gets out of the boat in the middle of the sea in a storm, and he starts walking toward the Lord. Wonderful scene, dramatic scene. We aren't told what prompted Peter to, to do that, you know, what, what his motivation was. Matthew doesn't say. Was he scared enough that he was willing to do that just so he could get closer to Jesus in the midst of this? Or was he so amazed by what he was seeing that he, he just forgot his caution and, and stepped out. Matthew doesn't tell us. We're just left to guess. All we know is he sees this shadowy figure and this mysterious thing he can't explain, and he recognizes in it that voice saying, do not fear, uh, that that's God. And apparently, something deep inside him must have said something like, I know that sinking in life is, is something that's real. I know that sinking is something that's to be avoided. But I also know something beyond that. I know that sinking is not the most real thing in the world. I know that when God is with me, buoyancy is where I can place my trust. Buoyancy is more powerful than sinking when you're in the presence of God. And I think, you know, we all know experiences of sinking, you know, losing our confidence starting to fail. We all know that they're real. But what I love about the story is that Peter bets his life that sinking is not the most real thing. He bets his life on that. With Jesus there, it's the capacity to rise that is stronger than the tendency to sink. That's the definition of faith, isn't it? To go through life like that, trusting that the capacity to rise is stronger than the tendency to think, to sink, and, and that's what I like most about the, the story. In, in Jesus' presence, Peter trusts in the buoyancy of God. And that's so important because when you trust that, when you trust that there is one on your side who is more powerful than what drags you under, you're free on this Independence Day Sunday. Let me tell you, that's where freedom comes. Uh, you're free to take a chance. You're free to be yourself. You're free to live. You're free to give yourself to causes that you believe in and not worry so much about what the repercussions will be. One of the most important books of the 20th century, I think, was a book uh, written by Viktor Frankl uh, entitled Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, if you've not read that book, it's a book that everybody should read that book. Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl. Frankl was a Jewish psychoanalyst who lived in Vienna and who was uprooted and arrested in the early days of World War II and put into a Nazi death camp. He was separated from his wife and his family. He was caught in this most bleak circumstance imaginable. And many of his fellow prisoners 
fell completely into despair. They had lost everything like he had. They were stripped of all their dignity by these Nazi captors, and, and, and many of them, he said, started to die. So they simply sat down and gave up entirely their will, and they just died. Frankel, being a physician and psychoanalyst, uh, began to notice that many of those prisoners who died weren't particularly sick, they weren't more mistreated than anybody else, but they just kind of stopped living. They saw themselves as utterly powerless and victims of this cruel fate, and it just beat them down. The wave just washed over them, and they just sat down and died. Their deaths were caused, Frankel wrote, not, by the, not only by the Nazis who put them there, but also by their choice to give up. And in observing this, Frankel said, I, I will resolve to take another way. Each day, while he was being marched to the work site, he began to think about a, a book that, that he wanted to write about this experience. He composed the book in his mind, you know, one paragraph at a time, one page at a time. He, he were over and over would ruminate on what he wanted to say about his experience in, in writing the book. And he thought about his wife and, and all the good times from their past. And he fantasized about what their future might be like together it, it, when he was freed from this. And, and he survived to write that book, Man's Search for Meaning. And uh, he attributed his survival both to the grace of God and also to making this conscious effort to remember that the freedom to choose how to respond is more powerful than your external circumstances. No matter what's going on in your life, no matter how, how hard or, or, or easy it is, what's happening to you is not nearly as important as how you respond to what's happening to you. Even when there appears to be no way out, there can be, by God's grace, a way through. Uh, and, and, and the way through is always yours. To, it's always yours to choose how you respond to adversity. That's very close, I think, to what the disciples discover in the storm that day. And it's also kind of worth saying that uh, for, for 2,000 years now, we take communion as a regular part of our worship life, just as a reminder that when the storms of life are raging, Jesus comes to us both to comfort us and also, I think, to shake us loose from the fears that can paralyze us and to invite us to try again, to remind us that we do have choices to make and to dare us to be God's people, to, to live because God is out there ahead of us in the slipstream, you know, calling us to walk where he's walking. So uh, if you've got something you're struggling with today, or maybe some headwind that you're trying to navigate on your own, uh, I simply offer you this story as a way to ask yourself, you know, what would it mean for me today to trust in the power of God to lift me up, to make me buoyant in the face of what's dragging me down? What would it mean for me to hear God invite me once again to, to get out of the, the boat that's sinking and to walk toward him, to set aside my fear and to choose a high ground, even if it means taking a chance? The truth is, you know, God doesn't give us life to play it safe. You know, we are given life to live. We are given life to live and to love and to care and to trust, even though the headwinds come and they are real and they are difficult. But we get fed. We get fed here. And we get the reminder as we receive the body and blood of Christ that in the midst of whatever chaos or difficulty presses in upon us, there is a presence. There is a grace that walks to us, sometimes in the most mysterious ways, and says from the depths of God's heart to ours, take heart, do not fear, it is I. Amen.